Well, if you are new or visiting with us this morning, one of the things that we have in our worship bulletin each and every week is a, a sermon outline. So if you uh, want to take your sermon outline, it might be able to uh, help you as I go through this morning's message. But I'd like to begin this morning by telling you a story that took place in 1929. It's a story about a man by the name of John Griffin. John Griffith lived in Oklahoma, and in the stock market crash of 1929, he lost everything that he had. <clears throat> so shortly after that, John Griffith moved his family to Mississippi, where he was able to get a job as a drawbridge operator. Well, one day as John was at work, his eight-year-old son by the name of Grace, he came to visit with him, and he spent the whole day with his father. And he poked around at the, the, the office, and he was asking his father just a, a myriad of questions about the things that his father did. But as, they, uh, as time went on, uh, a ship was coming along the river, and it was John's responsibility to open up the drawbridge. So as he opened up the drawbridge, he realized that his son wasn't in the office. And so he began to, to look around with a great deal of fear and, and trepidation. And he saw that his son was out climbing on the gears of uh, the, the, the drawbridge. And so he, he hurried outside to try to, to call to his son to try to rescue his son. And as he was doing so, he heard uh, the sound of a fast approaching uh, passenger train that was called the Memphis Express. And the Memphis Express was filled with about 400 people on board. He yelled to his son, but uh, because of the noise, his son wasn't able to, uh, to hear him. And all of a sudden, John Griffith realized the dilemma that he was in. If he took time to go and to rescue his son, the train would crash, killing everyone on board. But if he had closed the drawbridge, it would meant that his son would be killed. And so, in a moment, he made a very difficult decision. He pulled the lever and closed the drawbridge just in time so that the passenger train was able to, to go across safely. And as the train went by, John could, could look in and he could see the people on the train. Many of those were, were reading, some were laughing, some were even waving to him as they passed by. And they were all oblivious to the great sacrifice that the father had just made on behalf, on their behalf. Where's my dad? And I tell you that story this morning because I think the same thing is true with many of us as we come uh, to the table of the Lord. Like John Griffith, God allowed his son to be grasped by the jaws of death. And I think that many people are oblivious to the great sacrifice that God our Father has made on our behalf by sending us His Son. For Jesus, for God, it wasn't a surprise, it wasn't a panic move, but it was something that God did out of His great love for us, in order that we might be forgiven of our sins, and that we might be able to enter into the presence of a holy and righteous God. And our Lord Jesus was willing to go to the cross where He suffered and died, in order to pay the sins of the whole human race. Now, for the last couple of Sundays, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. And one of the things that I mentioned was that when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, it's something that we recite each and every Sunday, but sometimes we do so without thinking about what does the Lord's Prayer really mean. And I think the same thing can be said about coming to the communion table. In just a few moments, we're going to be coming to celebrate communion. But I wonder how many of us, like those that were on the Memphis Express, go about our own business without fully recognizing what Jesus has done by his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. And so this morning, I'd like us to pause and to do some reflection on communion. And I hope that this will be a reminder to us of what this sacrament means and that we might be able to partake in a, in a deeper, more meaningful way this morning. Now, communion is one of two sacraments that most Protestant churches observe. In the Catholic Church, they observe seven different sacraments. 
but in the Protestant Church, we observe two. Well, what is a, a sacrament? A sacrament is a ritual which Jesus commanded us to do. And the first sacrament is baptism. In the Great Commission that I spoke about last month, we remember that in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and then Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and surely I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. And so Jesus commanded that if you come to Christ, if you are a believer, that you need to make a public profession of your faith, and we do that through the sacrament of baptism. And this is a sacrament that we only need to do once. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, the Apostle Paul said, There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So this is a sacrament that we only observe one time. The second sacrament is that of the Lord's Supper. And this is a sacrament, this is a ritual that we do on a regular basis. And that's why we do it here, usually the first Sunday of every month. Sometimes we do it on special occasions such as Good Friday. And sometimes people are unable to come to worship service and then I'm very happy to go to their home and to administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper with them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul wrote, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. So Paul says, do this. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and he was explaining to them what the meaning of the Lord's Supper really meant. It's not something that is optional for the believer, but rather it's a direct command of our Lord Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, besides the word communion, can anyone tell me what are the other names to describe this sacrament? I've already mentioned one. Mentioned besides communion, there's the Lord's Supper. Does anyone know another name that we use as we come to celebrate communion? Yai? Oh. Oh, yes. The Eucharist. Or... Some people refer to it as the Holy Eucharist. But Eucharist means thanksgiving. And this is a term that is most often used in the Episcopal or the Lutheran church. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 33, the Apostle Paul is giving words of institution, or he's giving words of instructions about how believers ought to come to the table of the Lord. And so I want to share with you this morning... Um, this passage of scripture, and then five words that I hope will help us to come to the Lord's table in a worthy manner. So, beginning at chapter 11, verse 23, we read these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Well, what instructions is Paul giving to us? And the first thing that I 
want to mention is that the Lord's Supper is an expression. The Lord's Supper is an expression. Verse 24 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so as we come to the Lord's table, one of the things that we are doing is that we are expressing our love for Jesus. We're expressing our love for Jesus by remembering what Jesus has done for us. A couple of months ago, we had a memorial service for Helen Uchida. And this coming Saturday, we're going to be having a memorial service for Clifford Nakajima. Now, one of the things that we do as we have a memorial service is that we remember them. We remember them with love. We remember them with affection. We remember what they meant to each one of us. And by your, your participation as you can, you're expressing your love to the family and to others, what that person has meant to you. Likewise, as we come to the table of the Lord, we are remembering what Jesus has done for us, and we're expressing our love for Jesus. We remember God's love, that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We remember that Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life, that there was no sin found in Jesus. We remember His earthly ministry that was completed on the cross of Calvary, where He suffered and died and shed His blood for the forgiveness of sins. We remember that the cross was the ultimate demonstration of God's love for us. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated His love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so as we come to the table of the Lord, we're expressing our love for Him. So as you come and as you partake, just to say a short prayer. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. I, I appreciate it so much. I love you, Lord. And so I hope that as we come to the table of the Lord, it wouldn't just be a, a ritual, a routine act that we do mindlessly going through, but it's an opportunity for us to really express our love for the Lord. And so as we partake of the bread, the bread is a symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us. And when we partake of the bread, we remember the suffering of our Savior, that this was a painful death, that this was an agonizing form of death. It was the most agonizing form of torture that was ever devised by humankind. And we recognize that it was because of the gravity of our sins that Jesus was nailed to the cross. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, we read, But He, meaning Jesus, was pierced through for our transgressions. He, meaning Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Jesus. And by Jesus' scourging, by the whipping that He endured, we're healed. And so as we come to the table, we're expressing our love for Him, for all that He endured. The second element of the Lord's Supper that we partake of is the cup. And the cup symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was poured out or that was shed for our forgiveness. You know, when you think about it, life is in the blood. We need blood circulating through us in order to have life. And in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, we read, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is by the blood, for it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. And so for the children of Israel, the life of an animal had to be sacrificed on their behalf. And by the shedding of the blood of a sacrificial animal, the nation of Israel was forgiven. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that's why a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins was needed. It was needed in the Old Testament where they sacrificed an unblemished lamb. And Jesus is often called the Lamb of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, You are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Because Christ's body was broken for us, because His blood was shed for us, we are forgiven of our sins, and we have the privilege, the opportunity of expressing our love for Him. Secondly, the Lord's Supper is an explanation. Verse 26 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now the word proclaim literally means to tell. Thus, every time we gather at the Lord's table, we have the opportunity to tell or explain to others that Christ came into the world to save sinners, and that through His death on the cross, through His resurrection from the dead, we can have the hope of eternal relationship with Him and the kingdom of heaven. We can have life today. John 10.10 10 says that Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. But it's not only an earthly joy that we can experience, we'll also be able to spend an eternity with God in heaven. You see, the Bible doesn't say that everyone goes to heaven. When you think about it, how about people like Hitler, who was responsible for the extermination of six million Jews? How about the hijackers who commandeered the planes that rammed into the Twin Towers where 3,000 people were killed? How about members of ISIS who are killing Egyptian and Ethiopian Christians in Libya and Syria? The Bible doesn't say that everyone is saved, but only those who invited Christ into their hearts and lives. The Bible says that we're saved through personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. So every time we come to the Lord's table, it's important for us to remember that Christ came to forgive us of our sins and that we're reminded that the way to heaven is through personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. The third thing that the Lord's Supper teaches us is that it's an expectation. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So when we come to the Lord's table, we're testifying that one day Jesus is going to return again. And that's what we call the second coming of Christ. And as you read through the scripture, there's hundreds of scripture verses that speak of the second coming of Jesus. And if you ever look at the very last words in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22 verse 20 says, Jesus is saying, yes, I am coming soon. So Jesus is telling us that not only did he come as that small baby in a manger, but one day he's going to return to earth again. He's going to ascend from, <clears throat> descend from heaven, and those who are in Christ are going to be met up with the Lord and will be with the Lord forever. And so the Christ who was born at Bethlehem, the Christ who lived a perfectly sinless life, the Christ who was crucified on the, on the cross for our sins, the Christ who conquered sin and abolished death by rising from the dead, the Christ that we have fellowship with today, this very same Christ is going to return again. And so when we come to the Lord's table, we remember the second coming of Christ, and we look forward with anticipation of one day that we will be with the Lord in heaven. The third and fourth thing is that the Lord's Supper is an explanation. One of the things that it says in verse 28, it says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so as we come to the table of the Lord, one of the things that's important for us to do is to recognize that we sin, we fall short of a God who is holy and righteous. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin. John 16, 8 says that when He comes, or when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So before we come to the table of the Lord, we're going to have a moment just to pause and to be still. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance maybe those things that we have said that we shouldn't have said. Maybe the things that we've done that we shouldn't have done. Maybe the things that we've thought but we shouldn't have thought. Even the good things that we know that we should have done and didn't do them. Those are the things that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. And it's an opportunity for us to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our hearts. For us to examine our lives. And then just to say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. In verses 29 and 30 it says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number have fallen asleep. But verse 31 goes on to say, But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So confession of sin is very important as we come to partake of the communion elements. And we remember what... 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins to God, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We all sin. We all fall short. 
but because of what Christ has done for us, in Christ we are forgiven. And then the last thing, the Lord's Supper, is an encouragement. Verse 33. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Now, do you notice those words, eat together? One of the things that the Lord's Supper does, it reveals the unity that we have together in Christ. As we come to the Lord's table, it doesn't matter if you're a member of Wintersburg, I mean a member of Elster, or you're a member of Wintersburg, because I was thinking of, I have two friends from Wintersburg Church that are here today, Keith and Joanne Kenmozo, I got a call from them last night, and we had a nice time, they came to stay with me last evening. But, you know, they're from a different church, they're not from Elster, no, he said, oh, I'm, I've left Wintersburg, I'm not there anymore, I'm not serving you communion. No. The celebration of the Lord's. It doesn't matter if you're baptized here. It doesn't matter if you're a member here. We welcome everybody to come to the table of the Lord because Jesus Christ suffered and died for all people. Scripture says that one day people from every land, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue will be present with God in the kingdom of heaven. And so we come together. We come together as sisters and brothers in Christ. We partake together as a symbol of the unity that we have together in Christ. So, as you prepare to celebrate the table of the Lord this morning, hopefully that we will come in a spirit of love, that we do express our love to God, for His great love made known to us. We come reminding ourselves of what Jesus has done. We come to proclaim the truth of the gospel, that in Christ there is life. We come to examine our own hearts and lives before the Lord, and we do it together. So just as we, we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let's just take that moment to be still before the Lord, to close our eyes, and to ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. If there's anything that in our hearts and lives need to be confessed, let's do it at this moment now. I would ask that as I brought the message this morning on communion, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you. Father, you have heard the silent confession of our heart. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And Father, we pray that you would be with us now as we come to the table of the Lord, that we would partake in a manner that is worthy of your great love and your great sacrifice. For this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.